IWC just released the IWC Pilot's Watch Performance Sports Chronograph. This is a non-limited new addition to the regular collection. One of my first upscale watches was an IWC Pilot Chrono, specifically the Petit Pong's Chrono with an ETA movement. It's no longer in my collection, but I've always had a soft spot for the IWC Pilot watches and the IWC Pilot Chrono. I had to talk about this release because it got me thinking about how good watches come to be and what differentiates a good watch from a, well, not so good watch and some thoughts about IWC in general. Let's dive in. The IWC Pilot's Watch Performance is very much similar to the regular Pilot's Watch Chrono. Both the regular Chrono and the Performance are 41 millimeters. They both have 20 millimeter lug widths. They both have almost identical heights at 14.5 versus 14.7 millimeters. That's basically no difference at all. They have identical water resistance at 100 meters. They have the same 69385 movement with 46 hours of power reserve and a frequency of 4 hertz. Both are well decorated for the price with Cote de Genève and other machined bells and whistles that raise the movement above your standard brushed three-quarter plate and full-size bespoke rotor. From a dial perspective, you have practically the same design, on the surface at least. So a vertical three sub-register layout, large, easily legible Arabic numerals, day and date indicator at the three o'clock position. In both models, you get a display case back and the classic IWC chrono pushes. But that is where the similarities more or less end. The regular IWC chrono with a metal bracelet costs just a smidge under 10,000 US dollars. The new model costs $3,000 more on a bracelet. That's not necessarily wholly unreasonable. This is a titanium watch instead of steel, grade five titanium no less. That is the most expensive material. Grade five is the hardest and most corrosion resistant of the titaniums. It is anti-allergenic, so you do get some more, I suppose you can call them technical features over the regular pilot's chrono. The dial is also different. If you've ever seen an IWC pilot chrono, you'll know that the markers and numerals are all a bit one dimensional. The numerals are flat, opting for a very toolish aesthetic in keeping with the pilot's watch heritage. The sub dials are inset and stepped down from the main dial. The performance watch on the other hand has applied multi-dimensional numerals and markers. The sub dials are also raised and consist of two sectors, a raised and sloped outer dial surrounding the flat inner dial. The classic pilot is more subdued, where the performance pops and screams out to be noticed. Then we have a completely reworked bracelet, which is an adjusted version of the bracelet you'll find on the Ingenieur. This time with chamfered or beveled center links, unlike the Ingenieur. Then the Beads of Rice-esque classic pilot's bracelet donates the easy adjustment system that you also find on the IWC Pilot Mark 20, but was absent on the integrated Ingenieur bracelet. It's a wise choice from a usability perspective. Easy adjust is kind of a must have, especially at this price point by now. Finally, there's the biggest change, the bezel. On the performance, you get a classic racing tachymeter bezel in black. All these changes make for a watch that is distinctly different from the classic Pilot's Chrono. How do good watches come to be? The end state, I think, is iteration. I've been thinking about the life cycle of good watches, iconic watches, watches that have been around for ages and how they come into being. There's a journey there that I find interesting and I've tried to wrap my head conceptually around how watches like the Nautilus, the Submariner, the Blancpain 50 Thathoms came to be today. If we start at the end, the life cycle of a good watch ends, to me at least, in the state of perpetual refinement. The Submariner has been around for 70 years and today Rolex more or less doesn't change much. Many of us usually attribute this very limited amount of change to Rolex's slow, methodical pace, but have more and more been coming to the conclusion that it's not entirely a function of Rolex's pace of innovation. It's also a function of having a good, ultra-popular watch that doesn't need a whole lot of fixing. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as it were. The reason I say that this isn't a Rolex phenomenon is because all the icons, to some extent, go through this cycle. The Reverso is barely unchanged since its inception. The Black Bay having a much shorter life than the Reverso or the Submariner, but fundamentally the 41 has been through three iterations so far and the changes are relatively small. Same goes for the IWC Pilot Mark 20 or the Omega Speedmaster or the Seamaster 300M. Once you've got your watch to this point, you're in a good place. Missteps can happen. The Seamaster 300 for some has too big a helium escape valve in its current iteration. Not everybody liked the maxi cases of the Explorer 2 and so on, but it's correctable for the watch brand over time. You make a misstep, you adjust a bit and get back on track with the next release. That iterative position is I think the ideal business end state for a popular watch. People like the look, it's almost perennially popular and also it's much cheaper to make small iterative changes rather than coming up with something from scratch every three to five years. But how do you get to that iterative state? 
Well, fundamentally, I think there's two ways. Route one, unsurprisingly, is to come up with a good design that people like. Route two is to reimagine a classic. I'm going to focus mostly on the first route, but I think it's relevant to briefly touch on route number two as well. Route 2 is what Seiko has been doing big time for a while, primarily with the 62 MAS reimagining since 2017. Seiko have been a bit all over the place for some years, but in 2017 they launched a reinterpretation of the 62 MAS with one of many limited editions to come. The SLA 017, the SLA 065, the more affordable SPB 143, most recently the SJE 093, and also the latest releases of the new Marine Masters that oddly look very little like the Marine Masters I know, but more like the 62 MAS, but that's a whole different video. The point is, they know they have something good in the back catalog, they pull it out of storage and hope that it takes hold. If it does, produce more and move to that iterative slash refinement state as much as possible. This is also partially the route that brands like Breitling and Tag Heuer have been going. After years for brands like Breitling with the 2000s Giants watches and gaudy designs, they are bringing out models with much more in common with designs of the past, in the hope not only of repositioning the brand as a whole, but hitting a seam of popularity with these new updated reimaginings. Then there's route number one, invent or design a great watch. That's a lot harder than it sounds. The Audemars Piguet Code 1159 is a quintessential case study in this attempt. AP has one watch, the Royal Oak. They feel it's a problem, so they go to the drawing board and come up with the 1159. Was that watch a hit? No, definitely not, but that's not the point. The point was the board of directors said to the designers, give it your best shot. The mid case has a resemblance to the bezel of the Royal Oak, but in large part the 1159 looks like nothing else. It's completely original. In its second iteration, the watch has gained a little bit more traction and positive recognition, but this is the risk of going to the drawing board. Gerald Genta with the Nautilus, the Royal Oak and the Ingenieur were also attempts at the drawing board in coming up with something special, something new, something that hopefully one day would become an icon. We remember the ones that succeed. Bar the biggest watch nodes, most of us know nothing of the failures. The key though, I think in all the success stories is one thing, and this is an assumption, but I do think it holds true in car designs, clothing, watches, whatever. The success comes when you trust the designers. When the design originates in the hands of the engineers and the artists, you have the potential for huge success when starting, essentially from scratch. Of course they can fail too, but give those artists and engineers the reins and you may, just maybe, get a hit. Do you know what I think hardly ever succeeds? Watches that are designed in a boardroom. And this leads me to the IWC Pilot's performance. The IWC Pilot's performance is a boardroom watch. Do I know this for a fact? No. Why am I so confident that it's a boardroom watch? What even is a boardroom watch? Well, at its basis, most fundamental level, a boardroom watch is a watch designed to appease a market segment first, a trend first, and a design second. A watch where the money men set the direction for the design and the spec. This isn't just in watches. A boardroom PC game is filled to the brim with microtransactions and DLC. A boardroom kitchen appliance is made of plastic and has a picture of a famous chef on the side. The IWC Pilot Performance has all those hallmarks. A while back in the video about the Tag Heuer Skipper, I noted that there were four kinds of chronos. There were the luxury design chronos, you know, the Patek chronos, the Langenzona Rachapantes. These watches are not sports timers as such, but rather classically designed marbles with a focus on hand finishing and complex movements. Then you have the classic chronos. These are the Breitling top times, the classic zeniths, the Chopard millimedias and the like. Then you have the instrument chronos. This is where you find the classic IWC pilot chrono together with classic Longines chrono or a Hanhart. These chronos serve a more tudish purpose and fill a very specific niche of functional simple chronos. Finally, you have the sports chrono, the watch with the tachymeter. It's the Speedy, it's the Daytona, it's the Chrono Master Sport. And now the IWC pilot performance. The IWC Pilot's Watch has always been in this very toolish chrono category, and with a number of changes, most notably the bezel, but not only, this watch has been plucked out of its tool chrono vibe and moved into the sports chrono vibe together with the Daytona, the Speedy, and the Chrono Master Sport, and so many others. I say plucked out because it is a redesign of the Pilot, not a new design from the bottom. Why did they do that? Sports chronos are not typical IWC territory. The reasoning is simple. In a market where everybody wants a Daytona, it's hard not to resist the urge to offer a sports chrono of your own. IWC saw this watch, they saw the Daytona, and they saw that people wanted a Daytona but couldn't get one. 
So they said, so ein Ding müssen wir auch haben. We need one of those. This could be all fine and well, but the next thing that happens in the boardroom is that they get too involved in the design process. The requirements on what kind of audience this watch needs to speak to gets nailed down, but also, almost always, price points and cost targets get set. The designers have to hit a number. That means they can't start from a blank piece of paper. This is what has happened here with the IWC Pilot Performance. The normal IWC bracelet is far too formal and shiny. We need a sport forward vibe. We don't want to spend money on designing a new bracelet. So what do we do? Simple. We take the bracelet from the recently released Ingenieur, make a couple of tweaks, make the center links of the H-Link bracelet more aggressively beveled, and bang, we've nailed down the bracelet. But wait, sports chronos have easy adjust mechanisms. The Ingenieur bracelet does not have that. So we tack on the regular, excellent mind you, IWC clasp onto the Ingenieur bracelet, and you have sport forward with the convenience levels you want. The Daytona costs close to 14,000 though, and the current IWC pilots are less than 10K. How do we find a way to justify getting it in or around 14,000? Simple, grade five titanium or serotanium, depending on the model you pick. It's the hot material. And yes, grade five has some characteristics that make it more solid in some instances than grade two. It also has one more characteristic that the boardroom likes. Much like gold, platinum, bronze, and whatnot, you can charge a markup, which is greater than the added material cost and the added machining costs. You can raise the MSRP proportionally higher than the costs go up for including this material in the model. Then you have the tachymeter bezel insert. You have to have that. It has to be ceramic or some kind of black because that's all the rage. The boardroom likes that. But we're not done yet. It also needs some added sporty credentials. So we slap on an AMG logo on the back of some of the display case backs. It adds to the MSRP at very little extra cost. Then the dial gets pushed up. We thin down some hands. From a relatively restrained dial on the regular Pilot Chronos, you have something far more aggressive. Not necessarily bad, but just so clearly butched up to be more manly, more aggressive, more in line with the sports chrono sensibilities. If you've made it this far, you might think he really doesn't like this watch, and you would be wrong. I think it looks good. I'm looking forward to seeing it in the metal, but my gut reaction is it's good, but it's not a knock it out of the park stunner. I vastly prefer the regular Chrono, the Petit Prince, or the Lake Tahoe, or the Mojave. The classic IWC Pilot is a favorite of mine, but in the competition between this performance Pilot and a Daytona and a Chrono Master Sport, or a Speedy, I'm never picking this Pilot Performance. To me though, the problem has nothing to do with aesthetics or the look of the watch. To me, I can't get past the feeling that this is a boardroom watch. I know what it feels like for an engineer or an artist to be boxed into design requirements that come from a boardroom, wholly unfulfilling artistically. You feel so irrelevant when you're building a made-to-order watch. You're likely feeling challenged in terms of your artistic integrity. To me, when I look at it, I see the engineer bracelet, the Daytona-esque bezel, the compromised clasp, which was never intended for the engineer bracelet. I see the price markup for the grade five titanium that I do not need on a sports chrono. This is, after all, not a diver. I see the toolish heritage of the IWC pilot lost in a butched up reinterpretation, and it frustrates me. It frustrates me because I have for a long time felt that IWC was on a roll. They had a number of years back where they had lost their way. Back to the iteration cycle story I told you about, I remember how IWC completely mismanaged the engineer for decades. Patek and AP understood that they should make small iterative changes to their icons. The engineer has been a hulking behemoth. It's been an engineer in name only. It's been all over the place. IWC did this with some regularity with many models, but in recent years, they stopped. They focused on that iteration cycle, getting a smaller case for the Pilot Chrono, getting a smaller big pilot, relaunching a more true to the original engineer. Overpriced, yes, but still back on track design-wise. They've upgraded movements. The bracelets are excellent, and watches like the Portuguese and the IWC Pilot Mark 20 are excellent right now. And then they do this, not staying true to their design ethos, but instead falling back into one of their classic weaknesses, making a market-centric boardroom watch. That's a shame. Will there be people out there that will like this watch? Of course. Is it a bad watch? No, not at all. It's not to my personal tastes, but it's fine. But it is, to me, a boardroom watch, and that affects my opinion of it. 
a watch that departs from what IWC is best at in a hunt for a certain market demographic. That very rarely turns out to be a success. For me, I'm sticking with the regular IWC Pilot Chrono and IWC would do well to do so too. At least I think so. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Cheers.